All right, um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Chapin Cavender, and I'm excited to tell you about Open Force Field's work on modeling proteins and small molecules self consistently. Um, so, you've heard a lot of results yesterday and today about um, Open Force Field's mainline releases, Parsley and Sage. And what I'm here to tell you about is that a major milestone for our next mainline force field called Rosemary is going to be self consistent treatment of proteins and small molecules. And by self consistent, what I mean is that we should be assigning parameters based on chemistry. That is, if we have a functional group like a primary alcohol next to an amide bond, that should receive the same parameters no matter how we label that molecule, if it's in a small molecule drug or in a protein side chain. So um, I'll talk about some design goals for open force fields um, efforts to model proteins. To limit the scope, we're going to have explicit parameters for covering canonical amino acids and their common protomers. And we're also looking at trying to identify a minimal perturbation from the current set of parameter types that we use for small molecules. So we have good transferability to proteins. Um, because we use Smirnoff typing to assign parameters, this should allow us to have pretty seamless extension to cover covalently modified proteins. So as long as we have good transferability from our small molecule parameters that should capture non-canonical amino acids and other covalent ligands. Um, and one of the main goals here is that we want to have something that's going to be a minimum viable product that we can use as a sandbox to do open science. And that means that we're going to release the data sets and the protocols for training this force field so that anyone can grab those data sets and refit them to um, new targets or tweak parameters and how this is trained and allow this to be um, something that's a useful tool for the community to advance the science of how we model proteins. So because of that, um, our goal and accuracy here is not to be best in class, but to be about as accurate as Amber FF14SB. And we choose that because that's a well, a very commonly used protein force field that has about the same number of parameters as what we're targeting. So um, for this talk, I want you to keep this question in mind, which is that if we have good transferable parameters to cover drug-like small molecule chemistry, do we need to have bespoke torsions to model proteins well? So um, today I'm gonna to tell you, um, start by talking about the training data and how we optimize parameters. And then I'll show you some results from validation based on quantum chemistry data and NMR data for small peptides and folded proteins. For our quantum chemistry data sets, we are using model peptides that consist of capped one mers and three mers. I'm avoiding terminology like dipeptide because that makes something different to a computational chemist than a biologist. So we're using here um, capped n mers to describe these molecules. And so here, um, a capped one mer is a single amino acid with caps on both ends, and then a three mer is three amino acids. The data sets that we're using are using the open FF default QM method that Vaughn just talked about. And we use this to generate optimized geometries for capped one mers and capped three mers. And we also generate two dimensional torsion drives for capped one mers. Those torsion drives involve scanning the backbones by and side angles, where we keep the side chains constrained to the most populated rotomer from rotomer libraries. And then we also scan up to two side chain dihedrals, where we keep the backbone dihedrals constrained to the values in either an alpha helix or a beta sheet. To um, derive li library charges for the proteins, we've um, used the AM1BCC ELF10 method in OpenEye to parameterize charges for cap fibers, and then we get the charges for an amino acid by averaging over all the flanking residues for the residue in the middle. I'm showing on this slide the charges for an alanine main chain residue where the amber resp charges are in blue and the ELF10 charges are in orange. And you can see from this that the backbone atoms that are involved in hydrogen bonds are more polar. They have higher magnitude charges. So we're looking um, for that at the um, amide bonds on the left and the carbonyl on the right. And we expect from that that this means these charges will interact more strongly with other charged species. That would mean they have stronger hydrogen bonds both within the protein and also to solvent molecules. This is how we are deriving parameters. So the initial force field comes by taking most things copied from the small molecule sage force field and also adding in the library charges that I, for proteins I just talked about. That initial force field then is allowed to see the training data for small molecule QC data sets, the same set used to train sage, 
and also the new protein QC data. I then optimized the valence parameters and the amplitudes of proper torsions while keeping Leonard Jones the same. And then that produces the final force field. I'm gonna tell you today about two different models. So if we think about the starting force field as a fork of the SAGE force field, where I've included the protein library charges, I'm gonna call that initial point with no optimization SAGE-CC, that's my initials. And if I then take that and optimize it, I'm gonna, with, I add no additional parameter types, so the same number of parameters and types as in the SAGE force field for small molecules. I'm gonna call that the null model after it's been optimized. A second model I'm gonna call the specific model. And that one has about 100 extra bespoke torsion parameters, um, which are all modeling proper torsions and proteins. And these are inspired by the same number and types of parameters you see in the FF14SB force field. So next, I'll tell you about validation of those optimized models on uh, quantum chemistry data. So this is the standard step plot that we use to look at relative comparable energies, showing a histogram over those relative comparable energies. And the conclusion from this plot is that if we look at the um, new optimized models, null and specific in orange and green, compared to the starting point in, um, in purple here, that we don't see any degradation in relative comparable energies. This means that when we train on protein QC data, we don't degrade our ability to match comparable energies for small molecules. I'll show you the same kind of histogram for geometric targets. Here showing RMSD of low energy compromers. And for this, we see a slight degradation in geometries, especially in the second bin right here compared to the purple starting point. And we see a similar story for torsion fingerprint deviations looking at internal coordinates. So if we're worried about that geometric distortion, we can tune that by tuning the relative weights between the protein data and the small molecule data when we do optimizations in the future. I can also look at some validation data sets for proteins in particular. So here I'm showing torsion drives scanning phi and psi in two dimensions for capped threemers that are not used in training. And here the root mean square error for the null and specific models is about two kcals per mole. And we don't see much difference between the null and specific models on this particular experiment. So to summarize that briefly, I just showed you that when we train as protein QC data, we don't see very large deviations or degradations in our ability to model small molecules. And also QC data does not discriminate between the null and specific models that have different numbers of parameters. So next I'll show you some validation for um, NMR data on peptides. So I envision doing protein benchmarks in three tiers, where the first tier involves only small unstructured peptides we can get very quick data on in less than about 12 hours. And we're gonna use these as a way to get rapid evaluation of um, ideas and evaluate models quickly. The second tier involves a small handful of folded proteins and disordered proteins, which will take a little bit longer to get information back on. And we can use these as validation sets to select a release candidate. And then finally, the third tier will involve a much larger set of folded proteins, which have more diverse structures, and also a set of protein ligand binding for energy calculations. And we'll use this last third tier as a way to assess the performance of the release candidate. So today I'll tell you about just the tier one and uh, one protein from tier two. I'll show you data on NMR scalar couplings, which are a way to assess conformational preferences for backbone dihedrals. So these are parameterized by a car plus equation shown at the bottom of the slide where the coefficients A, B, and C are fit either to a static experimental structure or to DFT calculations on model compounds. And these, uh, this expression looks like this where you have high values for scalar couplings when the dihedral angle is at zero or 180 degrees. And there's a minimum somewhere in between there that depends on the value of the car plus parameters. So I will show you data on about 121 observables from 13 uncapped peptides. We are assessing backbone dihedrals. These have a protonated C terminus, which is used to model the low pH in the NMR experiments. And I'm gonna solvate these, include neutralizing counter ions, and then simulate them at 300 Kelvin for 500 nanoseconds. To assess performance, I'll show a chi-squared value, which is basically just a mean squared error that's weighted by the experimental uncertainty in the measured scalar coupling. This means that the chi-squared values that are much bigger than one have poor estimation of the observable and values that are less than or equal to one are, um, have good performance on that benchmark. So this is the result of chi-squared values for the FF14SB and then my null and specific models. 
with both tip 3 p and OPC water. So an immediate conclusion we can see is that in general, um, these force fields perform better for null and specific in OPC water than in tip 3 p water. So we're getting better reproduction, better agreement with the NMR experiments when we use OPC water. I can look um, also at scatter plots for individual points, um, individual scalar couplings here, where I'm showing this for FF14SB with tip 3 p on the left and OPC on the right. And here the colors represent different residues um, that we have NMR data on. The x-axis here shows the experimental coupling and the y-axis shows the difference between the computed and experimental values. So a perfect agreement is gonna be exactly at y equals zero at a flat horizontal line. So one conclusion here is if you look at the colors for alanine and glycine in blue and purple, these tend to cluster closely around y equals zero. So we say that amber FF14SB does very well on small residues like alanine and glycine. But it does poorly on residues in the middle of the plot here that involve bulkier and more hydrophobic residues. So things like methionine, valine, and phenylalanine. And I'll show you the same plot for the null model. And here we can see that we do much better on those bulkier hydrophobic residues, but we in general will do a little bit worse on the, um, the smaller alanine and glycine side chains. Uh, we see a similar story for the specific model where um, compared to FF14SB, this model does much better on larger side chains at the cost of a slight worse performance on um, alanine and glycine. So I'll summarize this section by telling you that um, we can use OPC water as opposed to tip 3 p water to improve agreement with NMR observables. That um, on this benchmark, again, the null and specific models are pretty much indistinguishable. And that um, when we compare across all residue types, these optimized Smirnoff models have about the same accuracy as FF14SB for these small unstructured peptides. So now I'll show you a result from a larger folded protein. It's gonna be more realistic for running protein simulations. The model we're gonna use here is called GB3, which is a immunoglobulin binding protein. I chose this because it's only 56 residues, so it's relatively small. It also has no cysteines and no histidines, so it has unambiguous protonation states. And um, the structure of this protein is um, a beta hairpin that then goes through an alpha helix to a second beta hairpin, where beta strands one and four interact in a parallel arrangement in the middle right here. So I'll show you first traces of the RMSD over time for 10 microsecond simulations in tip 3 p water. And the main result you can see here is that both the null and specific models have large deviations in RMSD that happen all within about two microseconds. And um, when we look at those trajectories by eye, what we see is that those are associated with unfolding of an alpha helix. So here I've showed you the highlighted the C terminus of the alpha helix in GB3 in orange on these slides. Okay. So um, in orange is the C terminus of the alpha helix. On the left is the starting structure from an experimental model. And on the right is in one of the null simulations after about two microseconds where we see that the C terminus unfold in tip 3 p water. Um, here are the same traces in OPC water. These are now only at about four microseconds. So we've already exceeded the point where we see unfolding happen in tip 3 p And what we see here is that all force fields uh, sample some fluctuations in RMSD that kind of maxes out at about three angstroms compared to the experiment. If you look at all those fluctuations, none of them are caused by alpha helices unfolding. They're all caused by fluctuations and relative motions between beta hairpins. So if this were a sheet composed of entirely parallel or entirely anti-parallel beta strands, this would be something to worry about. But because these are two parallel hairpins that are then anti-parallel on the other side, we expect these to fluctuate some. And an unknown question is how much do we expect to fluctuate? So to try to answer that, we can go back to some more NMR experiments. So GB3 has um, scalar couplings, like I showed you before for the small peptides, but GB3 also has inter-residue hydrogen bond scalar couplings, which assess the backbone hydrogen bond geometry. Um, it's a relatively complicated functional form for this, but the important part is that the scalar coupling has an exponential dependence on the hydrogen-oxygen distance in the hydrogen bond in the backbone. So that's kind of the dominant uh, feature of this of scalar coupling is that it, falls off exponentially with distance as a hydrogen bond is, is populated. These are the chi-squared values for both the three bond scalar couplings assessing backbone dihedrals, as well as the hydrogen bond scalar couplings. 
And a conclusion from here is that in general, um, the null in TIP3P water, at least, the null and specific models um, have much worse agreement with NMR data than Ember FF14 SV. But when we combine it with OPC water, the Spiranoff models get much better. And um, the null model with OPC is just kind of at the point where it's smashing the accuracy of FF14 SV. Um, I'll look at some more details for these scalar couplings. So here, the blue points are um, residues that are in the alpha helix. The orange points are in the beta strands, and the green points are in loops in between those, those secondary structures. So the conclusion here is that FF14SB is kind of insensitive to water models. It performs about the same in FF, excuse me, in tip 3 p and in OPC. If we look at the Spiranoff models, the null model has pretty poor um, in tip 3 p on the left, many of the helical residues have very poor agreement with the NMR experiments. And when we use OPC water on the right, we see improvement in those helical residues specifically. And finally, we see a similar trend in the specific model where the helical residues in the kind of top center of the plot on the left um, have poor agreement in tip 3 p that is matched much better in OPC water. So I'll summarize this by saying that the null and specific models here um, can in tip water partially unfold an alpha helix that that seems to be improved by using the OPC water model and that is improving specifically the alpha helical residues. And finally, that if we use the null model with OPC water that is comparable in accuracy to reproducing NMR data on, on this folded protein GB3. So I'll end by returning to my question I posed earlier in the talk where if we have good transferable parameters for small molecule chemistries, do we need to have bespoke protein portions? And so far, the answer seems to be that no, we don't. That if we use a, what I'm calling the null model here, which has only small molecule stage types, we get very similar reproduction of NMR data for both peptides and folded proteins. And that's really encouraging for us. That means we're doing a good job at modeling chemistry that's transferable to other contexts than just drug-like small molecules. Um, so there are many people to thank for this work, um, especially the, um, I'm a postdoc in Mike Gilson's lab at UCSD, so I expect a lot of mentorship and guidance for this project, as well as other members in the Gilson lab. Um, our collaborators in industry, including Chris Bailey and Bill Swope, and many people from the OpenFF team, which includes um, people like uh, Paman and David Dotson have helped with learning the QC data to be used to train the sports field. Paman and Trevor have been important in helping to um, run the force bounce optimizations to actually do parameter optimizations. Lily helped develop the protocol for deriving library charges. And many people on the infrastructure team have helped to be able to even just load and run these simulations in the first place. So with that, I'm happy to take questions.